Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our revision lessons uh, tonight. So tonight, we would like to discuss a uh, law of thoughts. And I have chosen a very important topic in the law of thought, which every student of the law, and especially so, uh, those who have uh, graduated with LLB, must have reasonable mastery or appreciation. That is the thought of negligence. Yes, there are uh, other uh, thoughts, but by and large, the thought of negligence uh, takes a, a large uh, chunk of the common law uh, discipline of uh, negligence, of, of thought. So we would like to uh, spend a few days uh, that we'll be discussing uh, thoughts on negligence before we will subsequently uh, move on to defamation. And then uh, we come back to some other uh, issues. Uh, defamation will be discussed subsequently because if you look at the uh, matters happening in our country, I think that it's becoming uh, more and more uh, topical. And for that matter, it will not be bad if we uh, revise extensively. Uh, who knows? Uh, where your examiners may find interesting to bring a question. So having said that, uh, what is uh, negligence? And remember, we are not talking about uh, negligence in criminal law in any other area of the law. We are talking about negligence as a thought. So negligence as a thought is the breach of legal duty to take care, which results in damage undesired by the defendant to the plaintiff. In other words, it is that area of the law, the common law, where a duty is imposed on the um, is imposed on the defendant to ensure the requisite care when he is acting or when he decides not to act so that it does not occasion injury. It does not occasion damage to the defendant. So therefore, if the defendant has an injury or wound and he can establish nexus he can establish connection with the conduct of the defendant, uh, then, uh, of course, we are going to look at the elements very soon. The plaintiff uh, will be well on his way to get uh, compensation or damages from the defendant uh, for the injury or the, the wound or the damage which or the loss which he has suffered. Now, it is important to remember that any time thought of negligence is mentioned, there are certain elements which are constant, they are basic. First, existence of duty of care. That is to say that the legal duty on the part of A towards B to exercise care in such conduct of A as fall within the scope of the duty. So that is the first one. And two, breach of that duty of care. Breach of that duty of care. In other words, the person complaining, the plaintiff, should be able to demonstrate that on the occasion in question, during which the defendant acted, he acted, the defendant, the defendant acted in a way which actually breached the duty or the, the, the standard of care 
which uh, is required of that particular uh, defendant towards the plaintiff. So number two, breach of the duty of care. And then uh, the third element, consequential damage or resultant damage or injury. So let us keep that in mind. Consequential damage or resultant uh, injury. Uh, let's keep uh, that in mind. So these are the basic things. So anytime you want to find out whether a person has a cause of action against another, if you cannot establish these three elements, then you cannot talk of thought of negligence. And then let me emphasize that for examination purposes, right? For examination purposes, you may be given a set of facts in which one element or two elements may be more uh, relevant in terms of being the focus of the question. So it may well be that in the, the scenario that you are given, what the examiner is testing most is probably the resultant uh, or consequential uh, uh, injury, as it were. So uh, issues of causation and order, we come and talk about them one after the other. But when you are writing your answer, uh, you still need to go through the rudiments and point out that for there to be a cause of action, in other words, for there to be a factual scenario for which the law will give a remedy in negligence, there must be a duty of care owed by someone. And then that person who owes a duty of care must have conducted himself or herself in such a way that he breached that duty of care. And thirdly, that as a result of the breach of the duty of care, someone has suffered injury. Someone has suffered loss or damage as it were. So that is what we should uh, keep in mind. And then if, if depending upon the, the focus of the question, if the, the question is uh, you know, focusing more on let's say the breach, then the more, uh, of course the facts will be obvious. So that is where uh, the main issues uh, will be uh, as it were. Okay, so now let's uh, come back and take uh, the elements one after the other. Uh, if you're able to discuss uh, uh, due to of care uh, in this lesson, that is fine. So that subsequent lessons, we look uh, at the others. Now, the duty of care, is the very first element uh, which will enable us to have a case based on negligence. And what is that uh, uh, duty uh, of care? Uh, of course, we've all learned a uh, uh, law of thought, so we are not going to waste time. Uh, suffice to say that until the case, which we call Donogu and uh, Stevenson, uh, there, there was a case known as a heaven and pender, the case of a heaven and pender, uh, in which an attempt was made to formulate a general principle for recognizing existence of a duty of care. But that did not go far enough until 1932. Uh, when uh, Lord Atkin had the opportunity in the case that we all know, the case of Donogu and Stevenson. Donogu and Stevenson. You see, in your previous lessons, I was telling you that uh, you have to try and remember, I mean, cases associated with the principles. And at least for each principle, you should remember one case. And there are certain cases which are key so that if you say that you have learned a certain topic, 
and you haven't heard that case or you haven't read that case, then you haven't learned that topic. One of such uh, you know, cases is the case of Donogu and Stevenson. If you don't know heaven and Penda, uh, you could be uh, forgiven. But if you don't know Donogu and Stevenson, nobody will forgive you. So those are some of the things that uh, we should pay attention to. But uh, before uh, Donogu and Stevenson, uh, per Lord Atkin, uh, came to propound the general principle which enable us to uh, determine whether a person owes a duty of care. The law on duty of care had been quite a piecemeal. Piecemeal in the sense that there were uh, limited categories of relationship in which the law recognized uh, duty of care. So that if you had a case, if someone had injured you and you were contemplating a case of negligence and you could not actually uh, subsume or you could not place your, your case under one of those instances in which the law has recognized existence of duty of care, then you could not bring a case in the due to of um, in the negligence uh, as it were. However, uh, thanks to the uh, creativity of Lord Atkin in Donogu and Stevenson, you see how uh, his neighbor uh, 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 principle actually gave a framework which enabled us to. Uh, recognize a uh, duty of care in various uh, situations. And uh, we all know that famous statement. I just uh, quote the relevant uh, uh, portion. Uh, Lord Dutkin uh, speaking. In English law, there must be an some general conception of relations giving rise to a duty of care of which the particular cases found in the books are instances. The liability for negligence, whether you style it, search or treat it as another system, a species of copper, is no doubt based upon a general public sentiment of moral wrongdoing for which the offender must pay. But acts or omissions, which any moral code will censure, cannot in a practical world be treated so to give a right to every person injured by them to demand relief. In this way, rules of law arise, which limit the range of complaints and the extent of their remedy. Now the relevant uh, portion you know too well is coming. The rule that you are to love your neighbor becomes in law, you must not injure your neighbor. And the lawyer's question, who is my neighbor? Receives a restricted reply. You must take reasonable care to avoid acts or omissions which you can reasonably foresee will be likely to injure your neighbor. Who then in law is your neighbor? The answer seems to be persons who are so closely and directly affected by my act that I ought reasonably to have them in contemplation as being so affected when I am directing my mind to the acts or omissions which are called in question. Unquote. So the takeaway from the victim of Lord Atkin is that to know whether you owe someone a duty of care, the basic question you ask yourself, having regard to my relationship to this person, and here we are not talking about geographical relationship, 
We're not talking about uh, a family or blood relationship or anything, no. Having regard to uh, my relation uh, with this particular person, that is how this person is situated uh, in relation to me, uh, if I am acting, is it such that if I don't pay regard to him, that he will be affected and I actually act without having regard to him, he gets so affected. Then what it means is that I owe him a duty of care. I owe him a duty. And you remember the famous case of the, the Donogo and Stevenson, they decompose a snail, uh, where you manufacture a product. You know human beings are going to consume it. So question is, are you under obligation to exercise reasonable care in how you uh, process the products, how you, you know you package it and for consumption and all that, so that to be wholesome? If you need to do that, otherwise your failure to do so would lead to your consumers or those who use the product uh, getting sick or getting poisoned, then obviously the law imposes a duty of care on you as the manufacturer or as a maker of the product to ensure that you exercise a, a reasonable uh, 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 care. But as you remember, uh, there are situations uh, in which uh, it may not be uh, so clear as whether duty of care should be recognized for the first time and so on. So you got the case of uh, Kaparo Dekman. So that is another case that, if you cannot remember all the other cases, you should also remember Kaparo Industries uh, against uh, uh, Dekman, uh, where uh, the court actually gave us uh, uh, more uh, guidelines regarding how to uh, recognize a duty of care where it has never been recognized before, despite, uh, if you like, the, the start of the Nudungu uh, approach. So uh, in Kaparo and Dickman, uh, the point uh, was made that apart from establishing uh, that there was a proximity along the lines of Donogu and Stevenson, proximity in the sense that if you don't pay attention to the person who is to be affected by what you do, then definitely uh, the law will say that uh, there was a duty you owed him because you know that if you didn't pay attention to him or her in the actions that you're taking, he was going to be affected, then you owe a duty. But then, so that is what we call like the proximity. And that is uh, the same as talking about the, the neighbor principle. That is that there should be that kind of a proximate uh, uh, relationship. Then we also have uh, this situation of novelty. Novelty uh, in the sense that uh, there are some situations in which uh, the proximity, right? The proximity may not be very straightforward. So you need to bring uh, to bear some other uh, you know, public policy uh, considerations. So uh, and that is where uh, Dickman, uh, Caparo and Dickman become uh, very handy. That is it fair? Is it just and reasonable to say that in this particular situation, there was that sufficient uh, proximity in which the law will impose a, a duty on someone. So as uh, you notice, the making a determination as whether it is fair, whether it is just and reasonable, is we are, we are weighing a lot of uh, uh, factors. Uh, for example, if uh, an uh, 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 ambulance, right? An ambulance, for example, jumped the, 
the the traffic uh you know the red and because it was on the core and ran into uh another vehicle in the process uh clearly you will say that uh, an injury has occurred but then we need to find out uh is there a duty of care which the ambulance driver owed, let's say that the, the other vehicle, the other vehicle which uh, crossed it because the ambulance driver, for example, had had to jump the, the, the red uh, you know, traffic light and so on. So we have to uh, apply the the fair just a reasonable uh, dimension which uh, Caparo and Dickman has added and as I said we have to find out so uh, in in terms of what protects society and so on can it be said that the service of let's say ambulance you no know, the, the, the ambulance service is it of such a value to society that uh, we would say that it is not it is not uh, as somebody has asked a question I'll come to that will you say that uh, the value of ambulance service to society is so important that uh, we cannot say that uh, the ambulance driver owed a duty of care when it was on a sick call. So therefore, that's why the fact that uh, it ran into that vehicle, uh, a duty of care uh, was not owed. So there was no breach. And whatever uh, damage which has the occasion cannot be a link. Because in the first place, if there's no duty of care, then you don't need to look for the other two requirements. Because there must be a duty of care before you worry yourself as to whether the duty of care has been breached. And then if an envy is breached, before you worry yourself about causation, whether the breach has actually caused the particular injury uh, which is being complained of, and so on and so forth. Yeah, there's a, a question from the chat. Let me look at it. Uh, he said that, uh, can you explain the relation that one owed to another in contract? It sometimes confuses me to mean personal relationship. Okay, the person who has a question, if I have understood you, I'm just going to state how I understand your question before we, we, we discuss it. Uh, you want to find out uh, where there's a a contractual relationship uh, between uh, two parties as whether a duty of care can still be uh, imposed within the contractual setting. Is that the question? Uh, yes, you can just type your answer back in the or let me, or that person, if your hand is up, okay, okay, good. Now, if you have, a, 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 okay, then you said yes. So you want to find out if there's a contract between two parties. Uh, does a one contracting party owes a duty of care towards the other contracting party? Well, as far as a, a contract is concerned, you have what you call like the uh, terms of uh, contracts. And because you have uh, uh, terms of uh, a contract, you have to spell out everything that uh, you want to be part of the contract. And for that matter, if uh, someone uh, breach the contract, you pursue it as a matter of breach. Or you want to ask if you can say that the contracting party owed a duty of care uh, to you not to breach the contract. Now, when it comes to uh, remoteness of damages, right? When it comes to remoteness of damages uh, in contracts, 
uh, that is where uh, you have this kind of overlap that you are bringing up uh, comes up. Now, the purpose of awarding damages in contract, as we, we know, is to put the innocent party in a position that he will have been in if the contract had not been breached, right? So uh, if the contract had been performed, where will you be? So that is the aim of using money to compensate you. But then uh, when it comes to thought, if we are compensating you, the idea is to take you to uh, where you were before uh, you, you were injured, as far as uh, money uh, can do, and as far as it's not considered the too remote. So you see that uh, uh, one is more about uh, expectation, right? One is more about uh, expectation. And the uh, third one is trying to take you to, if you like, your pre uh, thought uh, uh, situation. Or in some cases, uh, especially when it comes to loss of future earnings, uh, when we are dealing with the you know, Civil uh, Liability Act, especially where you have uh, you know, permanent uh, injury and things like that, and then the person cannot work again, or uh, the person no hard dependence, and then we need to uh, work out. Then we have the intervention of a statute. Uh, that is the Civil Liability Act, which has provided uh, unique rules, uh, how we should work out those scenarios. Otherwise, uh, when it comes to thoughts of negligence, if you have suffered a loss or injury, and uh, once you have established the other uh, elements, then, uh, the next thing is for us to find out whether the injury or the loss we are complaining about uh, is not too remote from the particular uh, breach of uh, duty of care uh, as it were. Yeah, so uh, Nafik, uh, I think that is the, that, that, that is the thing. And in fact, uh, if you have like, a, you have, a contractual you know, arrangement, you will not worry yourself about uh, also trying to pursue the, the thought uh, dimension because it is it's relatively easier to prove the breach of uh, contract than to make up the case for thought of negligence because there are a lot of you know, you know how to move from uh, breach and how to move from existence of duty of care to uh, breach of duty of care, issues of standard of care and so on, and then how to move from there to uh, consequent damages or resultant damages, issues of causation and so on is not uh, uh, straightforward compared uh, to breach of contract, because breach of contract uh, is relatively easier. So if you have uh, a situation where, for example, uh, the two options are available to you, you may certainly want to use the path, which will be easier for you to make out your case than the difficult uh, one, as the case uh, may be. So let us uh, keep that uh, in mind. So what I propose to do is that I will bring uh, a scenario, right? I'll bring a scenario. Uh, the next time we need to have a thought and use the scenario to uh, build uh, up the discussion because we don't have so much time and we cannot uh, do the comprehensive treatment of uh, one topic within just uh, uh, 40 minutes. If we get the scenario uh, or we get the problem type question, as we discuss it, as we relates to the topic, uh, it will help us to make a good progress. Yeah, so we do that at our next uh, meeting.
Uh, apart from uh, Rafik, I don't know if anybody has anything to ask. Otherwise, I have to excuse myself now. Okay, thank you.